Welcome to Growth for Good, the show about amplifying impact for nonprofits, charities, and social purpose businesses. I'm Daniel Francovilla, a marketing advisor and brand strategist and your host. On this show, I interview leaders at nonprofits and social enterprises and the organizations that support them. We discuss the wins, challenges, and best practices when it comes to communications, marketing, fundraising, and impact. Let's dive into today's episode. All right, Tanya, welcome to Growth for Good. So excited to have you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. All right. So we're going to start off with super quick. What is your 30 second or less elevator pitch for CSI? (laughs) The Center for Social Innovation is a co-working space and a community and an accelerator and launch pad for people who want to make social change in the world. Amazing. I love that. Very concise. I'm sure you have it nailed down. <laughs> it's been around for, for quite some time now, almost 20 years. I had my 19th anniversary on Friday. Amazing. Can you believe that? And I'm the founder and CEO. What am I doing here still? <laughs> You're still there. It's still here. I love that. Um, so we're going to start off asking about, you know, as the founder of Center for Social Innovation, yeah. there's a lot of terms Mm. being thrown around that Mm. maybe people aren't super clear on or super aligned Mm. and that we hear a lot. Social innovation, of course, social purpose business, social enterprise, Mm -hmm. and there's there's a whole slew of them. So I'd love if we could define some of the terms. So how do we first of all define social innovation? New ideas for a better world. Mm. Straight up. There's lots of different definitions we've argued. Does it have to be systems changing? Does it not? Um, You know, my feeling is that the definition of social innovation should be as inclusive as possible. So if you're working to make change in your community, in your neighborhood, in your city, your region, your country, your your world, Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, if you're working to make that change, you're part of a movement for social innovation. Now, strictly speaking, an innovation is really about a new idea that, or a renewed idea that helps us to break through, ideally to a systems change that will unlock a whole new ecosystem of opportunity. Let's just be clear. A win in the sales of good is what we need. Innovations we also need. But let's not get hung up on it. Let's just make change. Got it. I love that. So it's not about the structure and the formality of it as long as you're actually creating change. But that systems change is what, of course, is going to be, you know, the very sustainable piece that that helps move everyone forward. Um, Obviously, the economy is changing a lot. And there's a term called the next economy, mm-hmm. um, which is described at, for, for those who aren't familiar, uh, people-centered, sustainable, circular, just, participatory, and, and equitable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything. It, everything in this, all, all the words, all yes. It. But it values human dignity. Uh, it's conscious and it's caring. And so I like to, I would like to turn over to you to explain, you know, where do you think Canada comes? Mm-hmm. Uh, where are we as a country in the next economy? Yeah. And then... Lastly, you can share, you know, where does CSI come in and and step into that role? Mm -hmm. I mean, wonderful that you're asking this question. Uh, Many, many moons ago, I had an opportunity to do an op-ed in the Globe and Mail where I spoke about the caring economy, um, the next economy, the, you know, the, the, the ability for Canada to position itself as a leader in the next economy is Mm. this amazing opportunity. So many moons ago, we were actually rated number one best place to be a social entrepreneur. Wow. Now, that's pretty exciting. I don't think that necessarily we've done as much with this opportunity as we might have. But I think the bottom line is this. Capitalism as we know it needs to change. The economic systems that we have in place are holding us back. Mm. They are extractive and exploitative. Whether it's the people or the planet, we need to come up with new models. And when we take a look at Canada, because we have such a caring economy, because our world, our, our, our political context is probably one of the most progressive in the world, truly a leader. We have the opportunity to embody those progressive values, those caring values, the caring, the values of inclusion and solution into our economic exports. So from my perspective, I think this is an amazing opportunity for Canada. I wish we'd realize it, whether it's the green economy, the social economy, the caring economy. I don't really care. The circular economy, all of it is good. And, <laughs> um, and, and I think that we have an incredible opportunity to position our country as a leader in solutions-based economic systems. So where does CSI fit into that? Well, one of the things that we've done over the last 19 years is we've been working to develop and accelerate those social purpose enterprises, social Mm. purpose businesses, 
whether it's environment stuff. So we've done incredible work with our climate solutions and climate ventures work. We've supported over 135 companies that have then um, uh, been able to leverage over $100 million in follow-on funding and resources to get their climate solutions into the market. We've done incredible work working with marginalized women, low-income uh, people of color to be able to support their businesses to getting these ideas into the market. Um, so much of what we've been doing in the last 19 years has been really focusing on how do we unlock your ability to leverage your entrepreneurial spirit with making the change towards the thing that matters most to you, right. your passion. So, you know, what we've done in the past has been very much about sort of how do we support everybody to remove the barriers? But what's happening now, and we'll talk about this a little later, is like things are changing at CSI in a pretty big way. And we're moving towards a more strategic uh, venture studio model to support our next economy work. Um, because one of the things that's happened is that, quite honestly, the other accelerators across the Ontario region, at least, have figured it out. And when Mars decides that they're going to become uh, leaders in co solving climate solutions, I say yes, <laughs> great, fantastic. And our partnership with Foresight, a phenomenal partner, what we've been able to do is package up all of that climate venture work, package it off to them, and let them take the work to the next level. So if, what we're doing is we're sort of saying there are other new players in the market mm. that want to be involved in this stuff and that everyone needs to be a part of the solution. So we're going to go and figure out where can we add the greatest amount of value, most strategically, like acupuncturists for social change. I love that. I love that. And you've definitely created, you know, essentially a, a platform, right, and a network, which uh, a network is probably even speaking lightly to it, to, to the size and the scale of it. And also, you know, a lot of the connections that you've made personally over your career. So having been with the organization for, you know, just over 19 years, um, as you mentioned, uh, I'd love to know um, – how did you end up in the sector in the first place? Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, uh, what was a little bit of your journey towards getting here? Mm. Um, when I was 14, I uh, was asked to become president of a youth group. And, you know, those early starts, they teach you everything, don't they? Mm -hmm. Right? You, you learn how to organize. You learn how to, you know, persuade. You learn how to convene. You learn how to organize the party. Um, you know, uh, and this was... By the way, before there was such a thing called the internet, <laughs> and so we still did like mailouts and had newsletters and so on and so forth. And and so I've started my leadership journey really, really young and very, very quickly. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I founded my first nonprofit. It's called. It was called Earth Shoppers, and I was going to shop to make the world a better place. Okay. Now I got in there naive. 19, 20 years old, thinking I could do it. But I created my first board of directors. We had a a logo. Whoa, right? Had a newsletter, <laughs> got lots of media coverage. I was right in there. And then I realized that it, I was really over my head. Like, mm. wow, I had to actually evaluate what these big corporations and companies were doing. Um, so I started really young. Uh, I used my university, my so-called university education, to found three or four other organizations from the Global Development Awareness Network to you name it. I I was never particularly interested in, in, in education, formal education, mm -hmm. but I was profoundly interested in how you make change. Um, I'm 18 social startups in now at this point. Amazing. And, uh, and I've never not done this work. So I don't even know <laughs> what it would look like. You know, I've done it in every single legal model. I've done it across borders. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't actually know how I could not be doing this. So after <laughs> I, I started Earth Shoppers and I started a whole bunch of other things in there and a couple of the big projects that I was involved in was one of the co as one of the co-founders of Rabble.ca, which was an alternative news magazine with Judy Rebeck and mm -hmm. other phenomenal leaders, and then led the charge uh, to get the ban on BPA and baby bottles uh, with the Canadian Partnership for Children's Health and the Environment. And then ultimately, uh, with uh, CSI, I've had the opportunity to help co-found and create many, many other organizations like the Ontario Nonprofit Network and, mm -hmm. and Climate Ventures. And, and now, actually, the most recent one is Social Innovation Canada, uh, which yes. I was the founder of and, um, and uh, led that for five years and have just recently spun it out because I believe in letting go of these things so that other more talented people can take them and uh, take them to the next level. I'm more on the starter side. I stay at CSI only because it lets me start more things. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I love that. I think, 
your your journey has a lot of you know great synergies and and collaborations and, and overlaps and mm-hmm. I think that last point you mentioned there of being able to pass it on pass on the torch and let go allows you to number one do something else because you've got a lot of ideas and passion in you clearly yeah. but also it allows that change to potentially be amplified far beyond what Absolutely. you would be doing personally so I you know if you look at the social innovation Canada website for example there's dozens of faces right people from all all across the country yeah. and and it's incredible to kind of see this uh movement that that you started so yeah. well we we i've never found it anything alone got it always a we okay mm-hmm. that's a good point i think mm-hmm. in the nonprofit charitable sector it's important to take that approach it's mm-hmm. a collaborative approach and that translates to social enterprise no entrepreneur can succeed in a silo alone no way that, that's not how it works no that's right <laughs> it's definitely not um, I'd love if we could uh, talk a little bit about things that you're personally passionate about. We're all here because, of course, we care about making the world a better place. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of my guests have, you know, they work, you know, tirelessly on a on a cause or a charity that they that they're that's their job or that mm-hmm. they're founder of. But what are some of the things you're personally uh, passionate about? Yeah, I think, I mean, the the thing I'm most driven by in my life, and the thing that connects all of the pieces of what I do is ultimately it comes down to three words, uh, joy, purpose, and belonging. Hmm. And I create those, I bring those three ideas together in this radical concept called community. Everything I've done is about how we work together. How do we build social connections? How do we build relationships? How do we build trust? How do we build uh, ecosystems? How do we build networks? Um, you know, ONN, SI Canada, both networks. You know, why networks? Because if we can build the capacity of those relationships and the learning, then the kinetic energies and synergies that can emerge out of those relationships are unlimited. Mm. And um, I guess I feel so profoundly that, um, you know, so much of what stops us from doing this work is not knowing how to find alignment. And when I was a young, a young woman, I was learning, studying, growing wherever I could. And I went to a talk uh, from leaders of the Latin American women's movement in the basement of a church on Bloor Street. And um, I asked, I stood up, I had the courage at like 19, 20, 20 years old, 21 years old to stand up in front of, there's a room full of 300 <laughs> women. And I said, you know, um, why, why was it, what was it? that made it so that this could work, that this movement, that this campaign would work. And the, the, women, the woman stood up at the front of the room and she said, we asked ourselves one very important question. What do we agree on? Hmm. Not what do we disagree on and let's litigate that. What do we agree on? And can we build a movement around what we agree on? That was probably the most profoundly insightful thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, I'm not interested in left-right politics. I'm not interested in the dichotomy between the different worlds of, like, you know, strategy or tactics. I'm in. I'm all in. (laughs) I don't care. For-profit, non-profit, charity, business, corporation. We all need to be a part. So what do we agree on? We agree that we want our planet to survive so that it can sustain us as a species, right? I think that's sort of what we could probably agree on. (laughs) The question of how do we get there, what are the tactics, um, so I'm really obsessed with collaboration, but I will just say I'm, I am newly, in the last eight years, beyond moved by the power of nature. I am, I am shifting everything I know and believe uh, to a deeper understanding of our relationship and our fundamental need to reconnect and reweave our knowing that we are nature. And this, I, I just can't even... It's like such profound learning for me. Uh, it's so obvious, but I think we've forgotten. It's not just the walk in the park and breathing the air and take, take, take. Mm. It's actually about a, a fundamental reconfiguration and understanding of our relationship. So I'm, um, I'm going on wanders. I'm, I'm diving deep into the power of nature and to the mysteries of nature, and I'm I'm realigning everything I do and everything I build to be about how we can support others to reconnect more deeply and with sustainability because, and sustainability is too weak a word. Uh, 
this is so fundamental. Mm. Want to talk about God? Want to talk about spirit? You want to talk about social enterprise? It all boils down to how do we reawaken the mysteries of the relationship between us and the others. So I'm, I'm charged up, man. <laughs> I am so charged up. So if people want to talk to me about that, I want, I want to steward this city, this this region. I'm obsessed with saving the green belt. I'm really, really interested in what we can do as a. I'm so disappointed in the political parties, and um, and I am profoundly moved for us to organize uh, a citizens' movement to protect the emerald jewel which surrounds our beautiful city, mm. and protect this for ourselves, for food security, and for future generations. It ties into so many, so many issues. Like mm. you said, we're we're so interconnected, and people don't realize that because mm-hmm. your day to day is very fragmented Mm -hmm. and you order something on an app, you order Uber Eats, for example, Mm -hmm. and you don't see any of the impact from the gig economy to the restaurant workers, to the supply chain, to, you know, everything, the landlords, it's like, there's so many factors. I think that um, it's incredible to, that you're diving into that and how we're all connected and how we're all reliant on this planet, which is not a, not an unlimited uh, resource. That's right. right. (laughs) Um, Does that also relate to why um, CSI is purchased or is now has another property uh, in, I believe it's in Muskoka? We don't own it. Okay, um, you don't uh, own it. No, we're in a partnership with the Brunninger Foundation okay. to operate uh, Wasson Island. And yes, it has everything to do with it. Like it's, <laughs> um, you know, what a magical place. Uh, and, you know, Wasson Island, just so people know, is a uh, a six and a half acre island in on Lake Rosso in uh, Muskoka, um, owned by the Brunninger Foundation that CSI is operating. Mm-hmm. We're hosting a number of workshops up there. We're doing a social innovation immersive for one week. We're doing an art of hosting. We're doing a leaders retreat. And I'm working on, if I can work it out, I'm working on a gathering around this concept of rematriation, which I'll leave because I don't have enough knowledge about it yet. But I'm okay. working on it, which is around how do we harness Say the sacred feminine and support women's leadership in the next in the next hundred to two hundred years. Um, Wasson Island is about creating the space for retreat for us to heal our relationship with nature. Mm. I'm um, I'm ecstatic and I feel very very privileged to be able to ha- be in that partnership and and to be able to open it up to other folks who may not have had the opportunity to be in this spectacular part of Ontario. Um, but also so that we can deepen our understanding of the mysteries and, um, and open our hearts and our minds and our, and our intuitions to the way that nature is choosing to guide us as social entrepreneurs. Amazing. I look forward to uh, checking out the space for yeah. sure. The picture is very enticing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to just switch gears to maybe some of the challenges that you face. Oh, so good. With every organization, no matter the size or stage, there's, there's challenges that we face um, as leaders. Is there any advice that you know you could share? But firstly, what are what are one or two challenges that uh, you've faced or overcome during your time in yeah. social entrepreneurship? So many, so many failures, so much adaptation, so much resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll tell you about the most recent one because I think it um, will be interesting for folks. Is okay. um, at one point we had six locations. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we were leaders in the co-working space. I mean, let's just go back. What does CSI do? We we own uh, and operate buildings and have uh, created collaborative workspace for social purpose organizations as small as, you know, a couple hours a month, all the way up to giant, beautiful suites. Um, And I can honestly say to you that I thought real estate would be insulated from change. And that is COVID has proven Mm -hmm. that that is not true. Um, so in the last three years during the pandemic, uh, CSI has been challenged by absolutely everything. Uh, we did not expect that remote work was going to take off in quite the way it did. And, um, and we've been reeling and having to really adapt and readjust. Um, last year, uh, we went from 80 staff down to 30. Mm. Uh, we closed our New York location. We closed our Regent Park location. Uh, we are down to the two buildings we own and the partnership with Wasson. We spun out Social Innovation Canada. We spun out the Foresight Climate Ventures project. Um, And we're still uh, working with TechSoup Canada, which we also are stewarding. Um, It's been 
you know, I'm a grow, I, I'm a starter uh, to be in a situation where we're having to consolidate, clean up, reorganize, uh, deconstruct has been exhausting, mm-hmm. uh, hard, demotivating. Uh, it's not what most entrepreneurs think that they're going to do. Um, and I think there's a, sh- a shift when you go from being the social entrepreneur to being the CEO. It happened for me really explicitly at about year eight. Okay. And, um, and it's interesting because then I get like spurts of my, my spirit with the entrepreneurship, but then I get pulled back into the CEO role, right? The management, the HR, the, you know, the reorganization, the business decisions, the financials. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's not exactly the creative, the most creative, although sometimes it can be. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we've been really struggling with is how, how do we adapt to what we, you know, conceptually actually think is great. Like, look, people are coming into the office every day, nine to five, Monday to Friday. That's an industrial paradigm that has to go. Right. right? They don't think anybody, you know, the, a lot of the corporations are trying to hold on to that. You must show up and because we don't trust you in the workplace to actually do your job. <laughs> and I think that that's problematic. It's very old ways of thinking. At the same time, I don't want us to lose the power of collaboration, the power of alignment, of synergies, of the unintended consequences of of connecting face-to-face, and the magical embodied energy that we thrive in, right? And so one of the things that we're doing at CSI is having to really adapt, right? Like really adapt. We're pretty grateful we own the buildings that we do. Uh, Having created the community bonds back in 2010, Mm -hmm. uh, probably the most important thing I ultimately have done uh, for the organization because we own them uh, and it gives us the leverage. We don't, we can't be booted around by someone else. Um, but we're, we're having to adapt to figure out what work, how we're going to meet the needs of folks. We're shifting a lot towards digital engagement. We're doing a lot of work around online membership. Um, we're recognizing that uh, this is not, it's not about workspace as much as it's about the flexibility to find places and times and moments to connect and convene. So we're in business, and I'll just say, if people are looking for workspace, we would love to be your home. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we'd love to be able to find a way to create a, a perfect solution for how you can work to the optimum with your team, right? Because I think that's really what it's about. It's finding the right pattern for your organization recognizing that we're already moving into a four-day work week, right? Mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's happened. And, uh, you know, the, the city's empty on Mondays and Fridays. I don't know if you notice. Walk-by traffic is down 40% in the downtown core in Toronto. There's an article about it the other day in the Globe and Mail. Yeah. And we certainly, we, we, we barely have anybody in the buildings on Fridays. Um, and so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday becomes the opportunity for those connections, for the sales connections, for the networking events, for us to be able to really invest in the, in the, um, in ensuring that the innovation ecosystem, which is what CSI is, right? Like we say, oh, it's for the workspace, it's for co-working, but it's all really about community. It's Mm -hmm. about connections. It's about creating the, um, the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem, which allows people to find each other and to reduce the friction to getting those connections happening so they can get their projects up to the next level. And so that's been the hardest thing. I, I mean, honestly, going from a $12 million budget to a $4 million budget, that's humbling. Mm-hmm. It's humbling. Letting go of so many of my babies, it's humbling. And, um, and it's good. Especially at this stage in your career, career, in the trajectory where it was a lot of growth, 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 building, building, building. So that's definitely, I mean, I, I can't even imagine how, how challenging that would be. But seeing that CSI has survive the pandemic is is very um it's very good i think it's it's very needed it'd be mm-hmm. it'd be devastating as a loss but i'm sure either way it would continue as a community online which is so powerful i think it's one of the one of the best possible online communities mm-hmm. for change makers yeah. Yeah, i mean not you. only in toronto but yeah across, across the, the country. country and around the world i did i'm glad i did have a chance to visit the, the new york location um before it closed so beautiful eh? yes yes oh i miss it it was nice <laughs> we, um i actually was a speaker at uh, a conference there yeah uh which was amazing uh, a few years back and mm-hmm. my favorite location i will say is is the annex one yeah of course but uh i'm super close to spadina so i pop in there every once in a while as well yeah. and i think just the the vast just to to even just give a shout out to CSI, the vast amount of options that are available when it comes to meeting rooms and event space 
it has that very warm community feeling, right? And it's it's the right place for a lot of the important social innovation work that happens. So, yeah. well, we're we're glad you're here, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. and we really do we really do welcome people who uh, share our values, and um, mm-hmm. it's it's a magical place. We're actually going to be publishing. We did a member survey in 2021, and uh, it was interesting because we actually did this like in depth. You know, we had nine seven hundred and forty seven people responded to this. It was pretty amazing. Really looking very deeply at how we build joy, purpose, and belonging, and um, I'm really excited to share it. Uh, mm-hmm. We've worked so hard to create the the soft skills that um, that make you feel welcome and at home. To me, that's that's how you build the community. That's how you build belonging. Is that you feel a little a little sense of ownership? That you feel that our place is your place, mm. uh, and that you feel welcome. That's like the core. I love that, um, and I feel like that part of community gets thrown around in like the social media and marketing world as you know community engagement or community management, which is just like replying to comments or something, right? That's right. But this is a much deeper level of that community where people feel invested in the organization, in the company, and and. Uh, and that does speak volumes because it opens the door for referrals and, and new ideas and collaborations. Yeah. Um, I wanted to switch gears and talk about some of the successes. I think yeah. it's important to celebrate these successes. <laughs> um, a lot of times when we're busy, you know, operating many ventures or op- working in nonprofits, it's hard to even showcase those those wins and those success stories. Mm-hmm. Um, is there an example of, of one or two things that you're proud of, either in the whole history of your career or recent wins um, that you can share with us? I mean, so many. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel so grateful. Like, I, I mean, I think, I think the greatest win, uh, I mean, look, we've had many. But we bought buildings. Right. We created community bonds. Um, we, uh, we were home at one point at, at, to over a 1,000 social purpose organizations. Can you imagine? <laughs> a 1,000 places, uh, people and organizations came in. Um, you know, I'm so proud of what we've been able to spin out what, that we don't run right anymore, like the Ontario Nonprofit Network, like right. Foresight Climate Ventures, like Social Innovation Canada, like STEPS, um, like uh, Green Enterprise Toronto. Like there's so many of the incubated projects that we've done that I'm very, very proud of. We've done crazy projects off the side. I mean, we were the ones who organized the goodbye party for Honest Eds. <laughs> we were the ones, we've done like, you know, getting into a partnership with Brunninger to open up Wasson Island. Like, uh, I mean, but I think some of the things that I'm most proud of is I still have relationships with pretty much all of my former staff, you know? And I think that's cool. Mm-hmm. My leadership team, those folks, we still, we still touch base. We still connect. Uh, Eli Malinsky, who was spent the first ten years with me building CSI in the early days, is my like official number two, if you will. Uh, you know, wished me a happy birthday the other day. Like I, those relationships. You know, when it really boils down to it, this work. Sure, we're here to save the world, and we may or may not succeed. Who cares? Really, what matters most is that we're modeling the world we want in every interaction. That we're savoring the relationships that are so profound to the connections of what we can co-create together and that we're finding a way to like every decision put people and planet first mm-hmm. money second business second people and planet first and it doesn't mean you can make doesn't mean you make bad decisions it means you make informed decisions right. in every choice and that every everybody in your team and your organization gets to be a part of things so for me, um, but the final answer I just say is there's <laughs> nothing better than walking into one of our locations where I see people who I know didn't know each other, bubbling, smiling, and talking to one another. That's that's success. That's the magic. That's the win for you. I love that, yeah. and I've felt it at different different periods of time throughout. Whether mm-hmm. I was, you know, one of my very first um, part time roles when I had. Before I launched my agency, before you know, I was a freelancer. Is I got a role with um, Twenty One Toys. Oh and yeah, they were based out yeah, of the of annex course. location. And yeah, I remember, I, yeah, Ilana. I was I was living in uh, I think I was living in Brampton at the time, and I would commute two or three days a week to work there. And it was just like I wanted to stay. I wanted to hang around there, and and I did some of my freelance work. Oh, it was just it was incredible. So I think you know 
when people do feel that, um, they will stay. And I do hope that that uh, not only returns to pre-pandemic levels, but continues to, to grow. I want to just say one other thing, one other program that we've done that I haven't mentioned that I have to. For 12 years, we've been running a program that was formerly called the Desk Exchange Community Animation Program. DECA. The DECA program. Yes. We've recently rebranded it the Community Animation Program. And I just want to say something about this. This program has supported between 60 and 100 people every single year for 12 years. Wow. And that program has never showed up on our balance sheet. It was always this exchange off the side. And I, I just, <laughs> we did it we, in the member survey, we did a whole bunch of research. And I have to say, the impact that we have had on the community animators, the, the DECAs, we call them, yeah. uh, in the organization has been huge. Like potentially the most successful of all of our programs. And I, I just, um, it blows me away. 50% uh, of them new Canadians, 70% people in transition trying to find that their next placement. How do they go? Where do they go? Whether they're corporate burnouts. We've had judges in there. We've had police officers. <laughs> we've had new people straight from other countries all over the place. Wow. And they found, and they say in the, in the survey, they say, I found my housemates, my friends, my <laughs> lovers, and my job. <laughs> and I'm like, that to me is probably one of my proudest, um, one of the proudest things that we've done is to really change the quality of life for so many people in that kind of in that kind of space. So anyway, I had to go back and I love that. Yeah, it's, a, it's such an amazing program. Over a thousand animators in the last twelve years. I had no idea it was that many. I just assumed it was like two or three per location. Oh, no, no, it's crazy. <laughs> like, and we're like we're amping it up. Like they're getting the best training now. They get oh, so fantastic. I love the program. So anyway, there you go. Amazing. There's another innovation that yeah, that, yeah. that CSI has come up with. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what would you say is one thing that social innovators need to succeed? Either as founders and leaders or, you know, as the organization or business itself. Never burn a bridge. Never, <laughs> ever burn a bridge. If I could say every relationship you have, you're going to have for the rest of your life. And so make decisions so that you, and, and do the work, fix, heal, nudge, love, support, never burn a bridge. That's powerful. <laughs> that, that applies to, of course, any, any industry, but I think in one that's as collaborative mm -hmm. and community-based as a nonprofit and social sector, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's very powerful. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, all right. We're going to move on to a little bit on the kind of marketing communications uh, mm -hmm. side. So obviously we talked about CSI being a community. It, it you know, relies on members, uh, including co-working, mm -hmm. uh, co-working customers, events, uh, rentals, for example. How has CSI's marketing efforts evolved or pivoted during or because of the pandemic? Oof. Dramatically. <laughs> Um, you know, we really went pretty quiet. You know, another thing that we did during the um, during the pandemic in the early days is that we actually created something called the community rent pool. Oh. Um, uh, so I don't know, but we lost 11% of our organizations within the first eight weeks of the pandemic. Wow. Uh, you want to talk about vulnerable? Well, startups are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so we created a community rent pool where people literally paid what they could towards their rent. And those who could put in a little bit more did. And it was uh, uh, phenomenal. I forget the question. Shoot. No, yeah. <laughs> I got sidetracked by something. More so that, I mean, that, that's very innovative. Yeah. Um, I can't actually see anyone. I can't actually see any of the landlords applying something like that. No, so that's, we were it. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Um, it's more so, yeah, how did your marketing, oh, marketing. efforts change? Right. right. Yeah. Well, I mean, for sure, uh, one of the things that we were doing and what we're doing now is we're really trying to reach out to folks who are downsizing. Mm -hmm. Right. So where the opportunities for us lies is as work is changing, co-working spaces are actually perfect, right? I mean, we help you when you're growing 
and we help you when you're shrinking. <laughs> and so we're perfect right. for the remote team who's now dispersed across the country. Um, we've put in a whole bunch of amazing AV technology to be able to do hybrid events and and uh, and and co-working, you know, remotely or putting in systems all over the place. Um, and so a lot of our work has been really reaching out to folks who are in whose leases are coming up on those spaces mm -hmm. and who are looking to shrink because of the realities of what's going on. And that's been a, a huge part of our um, our work. And right now we're also looking at how do we diversify our revenue stream. So a lot more effort being put into our online membership and the power of the convenings uh, and the events. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, for us, working is part of it. Uh, and, you know, people come for the community and the beauty of the spaces. Um, but they stay... They stay because of the, the the social connections and the and the friendships and the opportunities uh, that emerge in the space. And so, yeah, we're just like reminding people that we still are here, yeah. and that we're still a heck of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so important. And some of the ways that you do that, of course, are you know CSI is active on major social media that's channels, right. which I see. Um, the the beauty of that is with all these members, you have so many stories to tell. That's right, which I love. Um, and the community, I don't know if you agree, but essentially the community helps to tell your story, 100%. right? You're not, you know, scratching your head, looking for stories and things to post about, which is great. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the email, uh, newsletter situation. So yeah. there's of course the, the email newsletter and then there's the, the kind of listserv for members. Well, that's right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our, um, our entire marketing strategy and not just from COVID for always mm -hmm. has been amplifying the work of our members. Right. Like that's number one. Our entire digital strategy over the last 19 years has been, you know, it's not about us. I mean, we're a platform. Right. It's about you. It's about what are you doing? And that's so cool because we get to tell, I mean, that's part of the value proposition is we get to tell your story. We tell your story in our newsletter, our, our, our uh, CNN that goes out to 23,000, I think, people across the country and mostly in the GTA. And, and we get to tell the stories of what's going on. So, right. you know, what are your successes? What are your campaigns? What are, what jobs are you trying to post? You know, what events are you trying to get people to come to? It's just fun. Like, I, I always say that our, our marketing strategy uh, is guided by the word cacophony. Hmm. Because cacophony <laughs> is what it feels like to be inundated with all of these opportunities. It's a bit, you know, like, it's, ah. But you do feel a sense of, like, this is where it's happening. Right? Yeah, and, the value is there. That's where it's yeah, and so the opportunity to, you know, our, our value proposition is so simple in some ways. It's like, hey, you have something, you have something, you guys should talk. You have something, you have something, you should talk. Like, it's like, <laughs> oh, you need, you're looking for a designer, you're looking for a comms person, you're looking for a, you know, expertise on this legal, this or that. Like, yeah. the inside all members list is about how do we help each other. Mm -hmm. And then the outside, the, the innovators list that goes out to this 20,000 plus uh, is about how we tell your story and mm -hmm. how we support people getting engaged in your issues. Because guess what? We actually really care, like deeply, passionately, madly, truly. I want you to succeed, because when you succeed, we succeed. Right. And when we succeed, the world is a better place. And that's pretty much the whole thing. <laughs> I love that. I'll just give an example of that, because our our agency, um, you know, we're a, we're a, we're an online member. I'm, I'm not sure if it's called a community member. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> we're a community member online, and then do good, do good fundraising. Who, you know, uh, I'm part of is uh, also a member as well, like a co-working yeah. member too. And I think it was incredible to see, for example, this podcast that you're on. Yeah. You know, there was an episode with with Rohit from Do Good, you know, on this podcast filmed here, and it was I saw it appear in the newsletter, and it okay. was like. It's incredible to see that all those kind of worlds colliding and then see, okay, who else in this audience, you know, can benefit from this content. And now you're opening us. I remember when it went out in the newsletter, there was like a little spike in, in views that day. Yeah, of course. And it just shows how engaged and, and captive that community is That's and that right. audience is. So um, just to reiterate the value of that for Thank members, you. even if you're just an online or community member. Not just. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best. I mean, I mean, if you don't need the workspace, right. we, we have unlimited space for community members. And uh, and you'll always be able to take advantage of the physical spaces when you True. need them, right? So it's, uh, in some ways, we see that as our great growth area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. One more question on the marketing front. Yeah, sure. um, I talk with a lot of, uh, on this podcast, we talk a lot of people who are, you know, marketing leaders, yeah. if not uh, executive directors or founders. 
And so we talked a little about, you know, what does that look like for you and as an organization? Um, for CSI, we talked a lot about already what that entails, mm -hmm. telling the stories of members. But what does the, um, the team, what does the personnel look like when it comes to marketing and communications right now? It's very small. Okay. Um, uh, we have uh, two people in our comms department. Um, and then we have our animation team. So, I mean, basically, the, what we do is we create these staff positions, which are called community animators. Mm -hmm. The community animators are the ones who really are there to nurture the relationships with the members, right. to build the connections, so on. They're the ones who get the news mm -hmm. of what's going on. Oh, they just got funding, or they just did this, or they, you know, they're working on this campaign. And you know, they're the ones who then say, oh, did you know? And they send the message to Colleen and to Ashley, and then Colleen and Ashley, they go like, okay, yeah. So we're going to tell this story, and then we're going to see if we can line it up with this, and you know, if it's Black History Month, or uh, you know, it's you know, Entrepreneurship Week, or what have you. And we're always looking for ways of telling those stories within that particular context. Right, right. But it's a pretty small team. We're wily. We're wily. <laughs> but we also rely on our members to tell those stories too. Yes. Right? So when Twitter okay. used to be big, and I don't think it is anymore, <laughs> um, uh, it used to be that we'd have like all of the, you know, the, the hashtags in the space and we'd let the audience tell the stories of what was going on in the spaces. We don't have to. And so it's very much about giving ourselves away. And I'll tell you what, uh, I at one point was a, a director of communications for one of the many organizations. And, and I, um, one, of the, one of the guiding principles that I have employed in comms has been always be giving yourself away. Mm. And that's a very antithetical to brand control, right? Um, but this is sort of a, a core uh, value here because if we're not always giving ourselves away, one, we're taking on too much work ourselves. We probably can't handle it. Like managing an ecosystem is impossible. You have to just be okay <laughs> with letting it, things happen, right? Sometimes it's going to be dirty dishes. Sometimes there won't. We hope to build a culture of people cleaning the dishes. That's sort of our, you know, that's the intention. So, um, and and so this this idea, if we're always giving ourselves away, if we're always inviting you to a potluck and we expect you to bring something. If we're always trying to find a way to tell your story, we hope that you'll tell our story. Right. It's this reciprocity. How are we building reciprocity into every decision we make, into every opportunity that we create? And that's like fundamental to the comms. It's fundamental to marketing. And so I think I'm hoping that we can re-embrace those ideas as we rebuild back from COVID. It's such a... Um, uh, in some ways, we've had such a massive turnover of tenants and, and staff and members, not staff. We've actually stayed pretty solid. Didn't lay anybody off during COVID. I'm very proud of that. Amazing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's finding that reciprocity so that we can all thrive. That's so important. Yeah. Um, what is at least one source of inspiration that uh, you would recommend people in the nonprofit or social sector turn to, whether, whether it's a book, a podcast, a newsletter, um, you know, a specific thought leader, anything that you'd like to recommend people look into? Oh, wow. Probably that is great. Probably opens up a, a, <laughs> Another a big can of list. Yeah. I, I, I'll just say, if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, do. Okay. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmermer will blow your mind. Um, I would say another one to please, please take a look at Richard Wagamese who has written an incredible book called Embers, um, which I think will shift, uh, could shift the world. And um, don't believe the media. The world is also getting better. And if I could invite your listeners to anything, um, limit the amount you expose yourself to terms of social media, the media, the news. Protect yourself. Employ what we call mental hygiene. You know, my dad taught me thoughts are things. And where you put your attention is what you will create. Mm. And I feel so deeply that we will live in the world that we choose to live in and that the lens that we bring to our work and to our lives is our personal choice. And um, at CSI, we choose to believe in possibility, hope, and solutions. 
And people have accused us of being naive or ignorant. Fine. <laughs> I choose hope, possibility, solutions, co-creation, community, love, belonging. And anywhere that you can find inspiration that guides you towards the positive means that you get to live in a positive world. So that's true. Uh, it's my invitation, you know, co-create the world you want and live in it. And fill yourself with those positive stories that helped reinforce that. That's right. Um, there's a newspaper that's actually in print uh, called Good Newspaper. Yeah. Uh, and I, I subscribe to that. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing to see the themes that they cover, but from this good news perspective, right? right? It's like, you need these reminders of what's actually happening, progress that's being made. Even if they're small, right. you know, uh, progress in movements around the world on social issues. Okay, I'll trade you one. Have you yeah. seen Future Crunch? I have not. Oh, let's trade. Okay. Honest to God, Future Crunch blows my mind. It's an online subscription service of good news. Of Amazing. what social activists have done from around the world, I love it. I get it weekly. I couldn't be happier. I <laughs> really, really, really recommend it. Future Crunch. And yours was what? Do? It's called Good Newspaper. Good Newspaper. And, yeah. and what's the scope? Canada or international? It's international. It is too. Yeah. And what's Good incredible is that as a subscriber, you contribute to it, of course. You fund it. Right. And so they actually print everyone's name ah. in every issue. So there's a page with everyone's name who's supported it. I'm going to join as to, uh, just <laughs> anything for good news. Yeah. Do you there know you what go. I mean? Anything for good news. Because guess what? When we read that good news, we see that things are possible, that we yes. can do things, right? Like I always say, coal fire plants. You know we got rid of them in Ontario. Why don't we celebrate that? Mm. We got rid of BPA and baby bottles. Why don't we celebrate that? Why are we always focused on the negative? Think about how far we've come. You know, we have clean drinking water. It's amazing. <laughs> hundred years ago, we didn't have that. Like, it's, it's a phenomenon. So, like, we've come so far, and if we work together and we build our relationships with one another and we don't burn any bridges, you'd be amazed at what we can create together. Amazing. Tanya, that's the perfect place to wrap this episode. Thank you so much for being part of Growth for Good. Such a pleasure, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Growth for Good. The show is presented by Daniel Does and produced by Creator Club in Toronto. You can find notes, links, and more about my guests at danieldoes.co, where you can also learn about ways we can collaborate. Feel free to connect with me anytime on LinkedIn or Twitter. If there is someone from the sector that you'd like to learn from or you'd like to be interviewed on the show, feel free to reach out to team at danieldoes.co. If you're considering creating a podcast or video series for your organization, connect with Creator Club at creatorclubstudios.com.